Hey, everyone. Hello. It's Susan Coffin. I'm here today for Attitude Magazine. It is our weekly ADHD experts webinar broadcast, and we're really, really pleased today uh, to welcome two of ADHD's most esteemed experts, Drs. Ned Hollowell and John Rady, to talk about a new topic or one that's a little pretty much overlooked, which is the euphoria and the energy of ADHD. This is something that receives much less um, attention than its, than its counterpart on the, the emotional sort of downside, which is the extreme sensitivity to perceived rejection or failure. Um, that rejection sensitivity dysphoria or RSD has been very well documented, but to date, the, the, the opposite, the soaring peaks of positivity, the euphoria that results from encouragement, from praise, from approval has pretty largely been overlooked. Dr. Hollowell describes this as our great friend, our ally, and our tool for growth and productivity. He calls it recognition responsive euphoria, or RRE. So um, today, Drs. Hollowell and Brady will talk about how to work up to your potential by tapping into the power of praise and RRE. So thank you both so much for being here. Um, we are always grateful. Um, and I want to introduce them. They probably need no introduction, but let me go ahead and introduce Dr. Ned Hollowell. He's a child and adolescent, psych child and adult psychiatrist. He's a leading authority in the, host, the field of ADHD, the host of Distraction, a weekly podcast for thriving in this crazy busy world. He is the founder of the Hollowell Centers in Boston, New York, San Francisco, and Seattle, and um, the author of books which have really changed the ADHD landscape over the years. You can learn more about him at www.drhollowell.com. And his colleague, Dr. John Rady, is the Associate Clinical Professor of Psychiatry at the Harvard Medical School, also an internationally recognized expert in neuropsychiatry. He's published more than 60 peer-reviewed articles and 11 books, books including with Dr. Hollowell, Driven to Distraction. Um, Dr. R you may have heard Dr. Reedy speak in the past on the power of exercise. He's the author of SPARK, The Revolutionary New Science of Exercise in the Brain. And he, he's really established himself as one of the world's authorities on the brain fitness connection. Um, so thank you both so much for being here today. I also want to thank our sponsor, Play Attention. Play Attention uses NASA-inspired technology to strengthen executive function and self-regulation. Learn how you can make your ADHD a superpower. You can empower yourself or your child at school working in a life of Play Attention. And now's the time to start for the, for the new year. Click here for a free consultation um, uh, or call 800-788-6786 www.playattention.com. Um, Play Attention is offering listeners a special offer. If you mention Attitude Mag 1121, you'll be, receive 10% off either a home or professional program, as well as a free ADHD assessment. So we thank our sponsors and Play Attention um, so much for supporting these webinars. We are so happy to be able to make them available at no cost to anyone. So thank you, Play Attention, and to our speakers. Before we start, let me just give you a few, um, an outline of how this proceeds. At the end of the webinar, a post-event survey will pop up, and it will ask you questions about the webinar. We hope that you will answer those questions. It will be followed by three questions that are, have a, a, a title called Required for Certificate of Attendance. If you would like a Certificate of Attendance emailed to you, then you must answer those three questions, the second set of three questions. If you're listening to this on replay, please visit the replay page on Attitude's website for further instructions on how to receive a certificate of attendance. Um, finally, let me point out that if you're having any audio problems, they're probably due to your internal bandwidth. Close any open browsers, maximize your internet speed, and uh, Drs. Hollowell and Rady will present their slides, after which we'll be happy to take your questions. So let me turn it over to them with our, again, our, our our huge thanks for today. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Yes, so thanks good. for the opportunity. Uh, for Ned and I to get together, it's a big, big plus. Um, and it, anyway, we're, we're, uh, we're publishing a brand new book uh, next year uh, in the fall of 2020. Uh, and its title is not settled, as, as usual in the publishing game. 
but uh, it, it has a working title of From ADHD to VAST. And the, the, uh, we're excited about the new book. It contains new information and a new way to conceptualize ADHD uh, and also VAST. Uh, and we uh, settled on the, 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 the term VAST as it stands for Variable Attention Stimulus Trait. Uh, we wanted to decriminalize or de uh, medicalize the uh, ADHD for people because uh, VAST uh, goes as a trait goes across many, many people uh, who have it, and uh, a lot of them don't have uh, the stigmata of uh, a diagnosis, a, a disorder attached to it. Um, we wanted to really get away from that whole uh, mindset. Um, and we know that uh, VAST can be a huge asset or it can become a crippling trait. And in our book and in our lives, we focus on how to prevent uh, people from getting into the crippling trait side and uh, hopefully uh, promote the huge asset side of of, AD, or of the past. Um, as we know, the whole uh, this whole presentation is is really uh, built on uh, the vast brain that is very sensitive to rejection uh, and also can thrive on recognition or uh, encouragement. Ned. Yeah, I mean, I just think, you know, it, it, it's high time to break away from the deficit disorder model, uh, which has served us well. It's better than its predecessor, minimal brain dysfunction. But, you know, it, 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 we need now to, to broaden it out to include, include the positives, you know. So uh, calling it a deficit disorder, it, it places it entirely in the realm of pathology, which it should not entirely be. Yes, it can be crippling, terrible. The prison population is full of people with undiagnosed and untreated, as is the halls of the addicted, the unemployed, the marginalized, the depressed. But so also are the halls of the most successful entrepreneurs you'll ever find, the most creative people, the inventors. The, uh, the You go to the top of any field and you'll find people who have this trait. So so we, we wanted to uh, balance it and, and call it... Uh, uh, variable attention stimulus trait rather than this uh, mouthful of pathology attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Now, we don't expect the, the DSM to adopt our change, but we offer it to people who have the condition as a much more accurate, uh, not to mention palatable uh, uh, term. You know, it, 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 deficit disorder is, is just not accurate. It's not a deficit of attention at all. It's an abundance of attention. The problem is in controlling it. So, so, uh, and and you know, and the the search for stimulation, which is always a central part of it, is not altogether bad either. Yes, the the stimulation you see can be dangerous and addictive and 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 crippling and even lethal. But so also can it be absolutely what powers you to the top. The uh, part of the condition is the is the drive to create and build and develop. And most entrepreneurs have this. So, so expanding it in, in, in not in the name of uh, soft peddling, but in the name of accuracy, of, of full description, getting it out of the realm entirely of pathology and into the realm of uh, where you see a trait. You know, it's it's a it's a good or a bad thing depending upon how you manage it and how you use it. And uh, in today's webinar, we want to highlight one pair. Of, uh, and by the way, in this condition, there's pairs, always pairs. You know, the, you can hyper-focus and then you can't focus. Uh, you're, you're distractible, but you're also curious. These flip sides, pairs of opposites. And, and, and the one that we're focusing on today, uh, you know, William Dodson has done a great job of, of letting people know about rejection-sensitive dysphoria or RSD, you know, which... Uh, uh, people with ADD or VAST are, are particularly prone to, but we're saying not only, but we're also prone to what we are calling uh, recognition responsive euphoria, RRE. And, and I think if we go to the next slide, we can begin to 
get into that a little bit. Right. So people with fast are uh, often embarrassed to ask for encouragement. Uh, so supporters have to uh, offer it. Uh, in our book, we have a chapter on stellar environments, uh, environments that uh, fast people would do very well in to have the right environment to provide the encouragement and uh, the recognition that they so really need to uh, get into that positive growth mindset. Um, and it involves uh, surrounding yourself with positive people, uh, asking people to be encouraging rather than discouraging, knowing that uh, many people with vast are, are pummeled uh, throughout their lives with shame and humiliation, and we need to offset that and help the environment, help the person with this uh, trait. And not, it, it, there's such a tendency to say disorder, but it's not. It's a trait, and we need to uh, get people to respond appropriately to help people get on the right uh, positive uh Horse, if you will, rather than going negative and feeling uh, shame and humiliation, uh, which leads to the RSD or uh, rejection-sensitive dysphoria. And it, we really focus on how important this is uh, to help turn the tables, if you will. And in, in our new book, there's a, a number uh, of, of incredibly uh, poignant cases as to what happens when you make that switch. So anything more, Ned, or you go on? Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, uh, again, you know, we're, well, we're not saying that VAST can't be crippling. It can be a terrible disorder. But we're just calling attention to the fact that it can also be a tremendous asset. And John and I are in the business of, of trying to uh, uh, turn it into far more of an asset than a liability, and, you know. So um, it, it's it's sort of how you manage it, and and we're we've come up with over the many years we've been working with people who have it, we've come up with lots of different ways of of uh, turning it into an asset, and. And right at the top of the list is, you know, what, what I say, cultivate uh, lilies and get rid of leeches. You know, leeches are people or projects that just aren't worth it. And, you know, uh, you, you need to get rid of them. On the other hand, lilies are people or projects that are worth it. They maybe take a whole lot of work, like raising a child is <laughs> a lily, a whole lot of work, but it's worth it. Whereas, um, you know, a, a colleague or a job that's nothing but a pain in your back, uh, you probably want to get rid of that. And, and you know, we often, we often who have this condition stick with leeches and, and uh, because we think we should or because of inertia, we feel guilty, what have you. Uh, try to get past that and, and just if you get rid of one leech, you have no idea how much more energy you'll have because that leech is sucking on you even when you're not with the person or working on the project. So, so and, and that's that's part of being able to tap into the recognition response of euphoria is clearing the path, getting rid of the people who are chronically or the projects who are chronically disappointing you, rejecting you, getting in your way, putting you in those terrible negative places that make it so much more difficult to experience the high that that, that uh, Susan talked about at the beginning, the the euphoria that really is very much a part of vast. You know, the we have these pools of euphoria, uh, not just pools of dysphoria. That that, but in order to tap into them, you want to get rid of as much as you possibly can uh, the, the the obstacles that you that you can get rid of. The leeches is what I call them, and people or projects that bring you down, that disappoint you chronically, predictably, habitually, and you keep coming back to them for any number of reasons we can speculate on, but uh, uh, why ever you do it is not so important as that you stop doing it. And, and that way you free up psychic space for 
the positive for the euphoria for the uh, for when you receive recognition when you receive encouragement when you receive uh, <coughs> the kind of positive energy that we know is so important that it'll be able to get in because a lot of times folks with vast or what most people call ADHD are almost uh, impervious to positive feedback because they're so stuck in these negative pools, you know, and, and so you, you want to make yourself able to receive love, to receive praise, to receive encouragement and not have these barriers up that, that, uh, that can be terribly, terribly, terribly hard to manage and, and really a true impediment to growth and, and development. So, so it's, it's not just a matter of uh, feeling good. It's, it's a matter of making yourself able to be uh, built up by you know the nourishment of of uh, encouragement and praise, what we're saying you know calling you know recognition responsive euphoria, but to to make yourself ready to receive that, you you really need to get rid of the leeches in your life, get rid of the people or projects that are just bringing you down, disappointing you, and chronically frustrating you. Right, and and it, it's like they're. they're there's this tremendous energy for people with that that needs to be guided, uh, if you will, to away from the, uh, getting into the dysphoria or feeling horrible about yourself uh, to, to uh, see all the energy and the positive uh, use of it. And, and with the encouragement or the right uh, direction, it can really go uh, and do such creative things. So next slide, please. As mentioned, uh, William Dodson described uh, this uh, uh, syndrome, rejection-sensitive dysphoria, and uh, listed all the different characteristics there. But uh, it, it's really amazing. Uh, I had a patient who was stuck into his RSD, and just by saying, oh, you have rejection-sensitive dysphoria, it was like, oh, the other people do too? Uh, to, to let them know that he's not alone, and just by naming it, it was it was quite phenomenal to, to him to recalibrate and say, okay, this is part of my ADD. I, I let myself drop into this uh, horrible state, and he would do it um, all the time, uh, and had become accustomed to it. So he re- sort of retreated from the world. Uh, more than he should have, and because he was afraid of just dropping into this negative space. And by naming it, it just uh, caused a, a re- reorientation uh, to what possibilities life could hold for him. Uh, and then uh, uh, helped him out even further by using one of our medicines uh, that uh, 10x or uh, guanfacine or intunib, um, whatever your your choice is. But uh, this helped, uh, as Dr. Dodson sort of defined for us, it helped uh, reduce this dropping into the, uh, the the horrible state of feeling bad. And in our new book, we talk about. The new next slide, please. The new way of understanding ADHD by looking at brain networks, and uh, this is a whole new way of understanding how our brain really works. That it's not just this part and that part, but these parts working together. Uh, and one of the major ones is called the default mode network. When you, if I can just interrupt you for a second, John, the the, the one of the just to pick up on what you said about naming it, one of the real advantages once you name something, for, and for a lot of people, just naming ADHD or what we now call VAST uh, is the primary therapy once they, there's a name for it. Because once you, once you can name it, then you put it outside of yourself. You put it at arm's length. Instead of it being uh, owning you and you're merged with it, you're defined by it, you, you, you take it outside of yourself. You put it at arm's length, and then you say, you say you, you stop mistaking it for reality. See, a lot of times when people get in the grip of the rejection-sensitive story, they, they, they think what they're perceiving is real. 
But when you name it, you say, oh, it's just my RSD distorting reality. The reality is not that. That's my RSD distorting it. And then you can say, oh, okay, so you mean I'm not a total schmuck. I'm not a complete loser. I'm not a, uh, just a, a nothing. And, and then with that, you can feel a resurgence of energy. And, and, and so John was about to explain to you what the, what the default mode network is, because that's what's going on when you, when you fall into the grip of, of, the, of the RSD. Why don't you take it away on that, John? Sure. The default mode network is uh, is a primary network in in our brains, and it it involves a front and back part of our brain, uh, and they work together. And this is something that was discovered when people got into the uh, uh, scanners to look at the the fMRIs to look at their brains, and to, and they, when you enter. Enter into the into these scanners. You're told to just relax and think about nothing. Let your mind wander. And while mind wandering had this signature, uh, this uh, parts of the brain that were always active when you let your mind wander, and you think about it, this is where ADD people are a lot. Their minds are wandering, and if not focused, which is another network that uh, task performance network. Uh, which activates the frontal cortex and the, uh, the executive function and all that, uh, which ADD people have such a hard time staying in because there's this magnet to get back into the mind-wandering part. And when you do that, there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a problem sometimes when you are too used to it, and especially if you're getting uh, feeling bad about yourself, you can get into ruminations. Uh, and you can fall into this RSD uh, kind of thing um, that uh, you go over and over and over uh, where, uh, you know, how bad you are. And if you have a name or if you have some, some encouragement out there, you can flip that around. So uh, we, we really think that uh, – next slide, please – that uh, we can – change the RSD into the RRE. And, uh, Ned, do you want to talk a bit about more about the RRE? Sure, sure. I, you know, we were, uh, I was, I was, I've just been observing so many times over the many years I've been working with people who have fast, uh, not to mention my own self, uh, that while, yes, the RSD is real, it's opposite is real. So once I, I mean, once you start thinking wherever there's one quality in vast, its opposite is not far away. So I just took the words rejection sensitive dysphoria and turned them on their heads. So if there's a rejection sensitive dysphoria, then there must be a recognition responsive euphoria. And sure enough, there is. Um, and, and folks with vast or what most people call ADHD tend to get very little of the kind of encouragement, stroking, praise, uh, that that uh, that they need because very often they're screwing up, they're making mistakes, they're disappointing themselves and others, and so you know they're very accustomed to the negative side of it. But when you give them a little bit of encouragement, when you give them, you know, that that you know, and we can all cite the teacher, the coach, the parent, the grandparent, whoever that moment when they when they came upon us and gave us the encouraging word you take that and you just you just run with it you you just expand it and and it's exponential and and so and so uh uh you know we now you know really encourage all people adults children alike um find something and encourage it find a creative outlet. We, we folks with vast really need a creative outlet, and and the reason I write so many books, if I don't have a book going, I get depressed, you know. So so, um, uh, and someone else may be a gardener, someone else may be a serial entrepreneur. That's why they keep starting businesses. If they don't have a business they're starting, they get depressed. So, you know, find the uh, find whatever your creative outlet is in the book we call it the right difficult find the right difficult and then and then jump into it and and then if you are close to one of these people give encouragement don't don't be a dream maker not a dream breaker as my friend john croyle always said uh, be a dream maker not a dream breaker 
and if you you know and and it's the voices of realism and and all that that are dream makers well feed the unrealism that's where the great achievement comes from it comes from being unrealistic and and so you know you don't want someone to throw away everything on on one roll of the dice but but you do want to give them encouragement to their dreams and and uh and when you do that, they will make really good use of it because because that's just as we can amplify. We're amplifiers at heart. We amplify everything. We intensify. So just as we can amplify rejection, we can also amplify recognition. So give a little recognition and watch it get amplified and get turned into a sonic boom, you know, get turned into something uh, uh, spectacular. Just as we can turn a, a, a tidbit of rejection into a, you know, into a, a sonic boom in the negative direction, you know, so, so um, be aware that you know that the the negative drumbeat, which these folks often hear, uh, uh, does a lot of damage. But as damaging as that can be, the positive trumpet sound, the you know the the sound Gabriel's horn, and and you'll get a you'll get a a a, a wonderful uh, uh you know uh, a wonderful result of, of positive energy you know Ned and I've been talking about this uh, the positive side of ADHD are now vast for many years <laughs> ever since we wrote uh, driven to distraction and and we've been taken to task by the hardliners we call them uh people that say okay no it's got to be a disorder, and it's got to have these characteristics, and no, people with vast uh, can't really be successful, uh, which is garbage, because so many of the most successful people uh, that I see and the net have seen over the years uh, have a vast uh, and just need the encouragement or the, the change in orientation or a little bit of medicine for a while, and not even that, just to, to know that they uh, have some of the problems of that, which is, you know, some of the stigmata of ADHD. You know, they, they have a hard time sustaining their attention, and they need support and help to sustain attention. They need a, a planner and a closer, uh, which is ideal if they can get that to support them and to encourage them. Uh, and I think what, what, uh, what, what RRE is is, is really saying, look, there's ways of doing this. There's, there's situations, there's setups that you can get to uh, encourage your uh, bliss, if you will. Next slide, please. Uh, you know, and it's, it's the same, same possibility of, of uh, dropping into the default mode network where Ned calls it the, the demon uh, of the default mode or the massive m motivator, uh, master motivator of, of, the, uh, uh, of this uh, powerful part of our brain to help us move into new territories and stay with it and get, uh, have this positive uh, regard for what we're doing, what life's about, and where we're going with it. Um, so, that, and, and we know that criticism or praise can get you into the this default mode, get you stuck there. But if it's praise, it will help you get out of it, uh, to get busy uh, on things that are meaningful to you and to your to others. And and this is this is where we want to move uh, the whole field to sort of appreciate that we have to help create these stellar environments. Uh, in our book, there's a whole chapter on the stellar environments, which is about getting yourself around, surrounding yourself with positive thinking people that are there to help you remain positive and stay with your dream. Ned? Yeah, no, it, it's, you know, you, you can spend an awful lot of time dissecting the negative, uh, which I think psychiatry in general spends much too much time doing and not nearly enough time uh, pumping up the positive and you know you you build a lifetime not on remediated weaknesses but on developed strengths 
Now, for sure, in order to develop some strengths, you have to remediate some weaknesses. So it's it's not either or, but but it's a shift in emphasis uh, that I think the whole field of psychiatry needs. But particularly when it comes to working with people who have VAS, but you want to pump energy into uh, wherever the talents lie and and grow those talents, grow those interests, grow uh, grow that uh, grow that skill talent, whatever it might happen to be. And then, you know, it, 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 another analogy I use is, you know, uh, vast is like Niagara Falls, you know, and uh, it's just a lot of noise and mist until you build a hydroelectric plant. And then you light up the state of New York. So, you know, we're sort of in the hydroelectric plant business, helping people, you know, find, you know, what is their outlet? What is their creative outlet? What is their right difficult? What is their vision they want to pursue? And, and you, you, you have a Real difficult time pursuing it without encouragement, but with encouragement, you can do it. You know, I mean, uh, you know, my favorite group to point to are the people who colonized this country. You know, and they, what a crazy scheme that was to get on a boat in 1600 and come over here, and you know, darn, darn good chance you'd die en route. And when you got here, you had no idea what you were going to find. And but they banded together. They encouraged each other with promises of riches and adventure and a whole new world and, you know, just the kind of thing that turns on people with vast. And, and if you look at the lives of those early colonists, they, it, should, it looks like, you know, a whole, a whole crowd of people who have, the, have this condition. And so, so we feed off of each other's energy and we can, we can galvanize that and turn us into, uh, well, a group of people who founded America, you know, and, and, uh, uh, so many businesses are started by someone with a crazy idea, and then next thing you know, it's not so crazy anymore. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I can guarantee you whoever invented the wheel had this condition. <laughs> well, and, and, the, and the, the trick is try and remove shame from your life as much as possible. Uh, a, people with fast are so used to shame and humiliation because they've, you know, they've tripped up, they've fallen, they've uh, forgot, uh, they've had all the uh, problems of, uh, of a race car brain with uh, bicycle brakes, as Ned uh, likes to say, you know, and it's a perfect way of looking at it. And so the idea is to get that race car brain on track and keep it there. And the best way to do that is with encouragement. Next slide. Next, uh, there we go. Okay, so uh, uh, just as a little kernel of of uh, failure and shame and uh, humiliation and feeling bad about yourself can turn into tumble into a a real uh, horrible feeling about yourself and gets wedded to your uh, to your understanding of who you are. So too can a little uh, kernel of hope and motivation uh, can can take you uh, to the heights. And one of the things that is important is to try and create those environments or instruct people in your environments, your parents or your, your spouses or your, your work uh, force, to, to be encouraging rather than just pointing out your foibles and your failures uh, to uh, help you move, move forward and on to uh, the great things that you really want to do and accomplish. We know that uh, the ADHD people or vast people are resilient because they've had to be. They've, uh, you know, fallen off the horse many times and have to get back up on it. So they're used to it. They're expecting it. And they've had this incredible capacity to push forward. So we have to use that uh, to help them uh, modify their 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 lives by uh, going for the positive. Now, do you want to finish up here, or we're about ready? No, no. I, I, we should probably get on to the next slide. Okay. Oh, right. Okay. Praise instills hope, and uh, I just was sort of talking. You just about did. That. You did that one. Is that the last slide, Lily? Yes, it is. Yeah. That's the last slide. Oh, okay. All right. So let me uh, okay. yeah. um, just, you know, I guess summarizing, you know, that we've, we've 
been presenting the the our new term for ADHD, namely variable attention stimulus trait or VAST, with an emphasis on it being a trait, not a disorder. Yes, it can be a disorder, but it can also be a tremendous asset in your life. Just look at the legion of entrepreneurs who have it. Uh, look at the legion of unbelievably successful people who have it, inventors, creators, artists, actors, uh, Nobel Prize winner, you know, uh, you name the field, someone at the top has it. So, so um, uh, uh, it, 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 it's a, it does a tremendous disservice to classify it entirely as a disorder because then just people, we create a disorder by doing that. And the real, the, the disorder of shame and fear and believing that you're stupid and, and, you know, thinking that you can't do things instead of that you can do things, and, you know, and, you know, I have ADHD and dyslexia, and I wouldn't trade either one for the world because they're embedded in them are, are my special talents. So, you, you know, you, you and, the, and the challenge, which makes this work so fascinating and wonderful, is to how to extract the, the best stuff and minimize the bad stuff. And, and that's, a, fortunately, a very doable undertaking with the many tools we now have in our toolbox and some new tools that we're putting in our new book as, as well as some old tools, the uh, chief among them being education, just learning what it is and, and uh, how to name it, how to describe it. And then most of all, how to manage it and how to, you know, the alchemy of it all, turning, turning something negative into something positive. And, but this is practical alchemy that works and, you know, that, you know, the reason I love going to work every day is I just see the tremendous progress people make and and, uh, and the bravery, you know, a lot of them who have not, not even known what was going on and they discover it at age 30, 40, 50, 60. Um, my oldest patient was 86 and he was finally able to write the book he'd wanted to write his whole life long. So it, it's never too late to lay claim to the to the treasures to to bring out the bring out the best and and uh, and and it begins with with hope with, with and then and then somebody uh helping you figure out how to do it and it, one size does not fit all uh, for some people medication for other people simply finding the right job or or marrying or you know living with the right person uh, other people uh, an exercise program you know other people a meditation program other people find uh, various nutritional supplements and diets can be very helpful or all of the above you know it, it's whatever works as long as it's safe and it's legal that's the, the goal but always in a in an envelope of, of what I call connection an, an envelope of positive energy an envelope of of you know at its most intense it's called love and at its as it spreads out and attenuates a little bit it's it's called connection and, and that's really what drives the positive but we wanted to uh, accentuate today the sort of the flip side of rejection sensitive dysphoria, which has had a lot of press uh, and and say, look at its counterpart, recognition responsive euphoria, which uh, is a is a positive tool, you know, as opposed to a pitfall, which is what RSD is. Uh, rejection responsive you recognition responsive euphoria is a tool you can use just give encouragement, give praise, or seek encouragement and seek praise, and eschew, stay away from, abandon uh, the vultures and the leeches and the negatives, uh, you know, the, the people who want to tear you down. There are, there are too many of them out there, and just don't give them your attention. Don't feed them with your attention. You know, it, it, go for the encouragers, you know, the, the people who who are looking toward your dream right along with you. Should we start there, John, and, yeah. and do some questions? Sure. Um, thank you both. Um, the, the, your listeners are thanking you. Um, one person just typed clap, 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 repeat. And another one, thanks both of you for delivered from distraction, which made helped them enormously. So, um, Lots of positive comments here. Um, I'm, they're asking if we can put the slide back um, that defines VAST, which probably would be helpful. Let's see, uh, Lily. Sure, yeah. There it is. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, and one person asks, so what are the chances that the medical community will accept this definition and replace ADHD with VAST? <laughs> I, I would say zero, but, uh, you know, but uh, 
but that doesn't mean the casual, the you know, the the everyday person like you and me can't do that. I mean, I, I, exactly. I uh, you know, I think we ha- will retain ADHD as a research definition, so research can be done uh, from that definition. But I think you know, the average person could replace it today. You know. Get right. rid of ADHD and say no. Instead, you have vast variable attention stimulus trait. Yeah. Um, you know, when you look, when you talk to people about ADHD, so many people sign on and say, "Oh, yeah, that's me." But they really don't have a disorder yet, or don't have a disorder, but they have some of the symptoms, and it uh, oftentimes is this variable attention stimulus seeking trait that. Uh, uh, people have, and and uh, it gets in their way, but it also leads to, you know, massive achievement and 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 lots of good times. So that's what we want to promote. That's right. Um, so Erica says, um, a listener says, I've gotten to the point where I tell my managers and family that I need gold stars for a job well done. Is that a good way to manage the need for recognition? I think a lot of yes. people have a hard time asking for, for, for help, for praise, and looking for praise, especially when they're so sensitive to rejection. Yeah, because of pride and because of our, our culture, you know, says you shouldn't need it once you're over X years old. Well, that's mm-hmm. total nonsense. There's nobody in the world who, who doesn't need encouragement. And, you know, so if you have to just come right out and ask for it, I mean, I asked John all the time when I was writing this book, I said, John, you need to encourage me, please. You need to encourage me because <laughs> John doesn't do it easily. He was brought up in such a way that he sort of plays it close to the vest. But I say, John, I need encouragement. And so he calls me up and says, okay, Ned, go for it. You can do it. And, and it really <laughs> helps. You know? So if you have to be brazen about it, go ahead. You know, you Do whatever you need to do. There's, there's no – the only – thing that's not good is when you pretend you don't need it so however you however you ask for it ask for it and and then and then get it and i think she's great that she can say i need gold stars good for her and maybe the manager will take a lesson and realize everyone needs gold stars um, i think that's, another... that's so unusual that somebody sort of does that you know because it's, it's what they need it's what they need and recognizing that and and putting it in play is so difficult in our world today. Um, someone here mentions that in many schools, teachers are reluctant to praise because they feel that motivation should be intrinsic. And we know that motivation is a big issue for, for, for people with BAST. Um, as a parent, and she's asking, as a parent of a child with BAST, how would you suggest approaching the need for praise in the school setting? Yeah, this intrinsic motivation stuff, it's a buzzword, and, and you're, you're supposed to have it be intrinsic. Well, it's supposed doesn't matter. And, you know, uh, motivation usually begins extrinsically. You want love, so you do, what, you do what the other person wants you to do to get that love. You want a good grade, so you study something you could care less about to get a good grade. Uh, you you want to get your allowance. You want to you know and and uh, you know they're all forms of bribes. If you will, any expert who says you shouldn't bribe children doesn't have children. You know you 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 can't raise a child without bribes, incentives, extrinsic motivation. Over time, when you find something you really like to do, then the motivation becomes intrinsic. Like I now really like to write, but believe me, when I started off, I was writing because I was assigned it and I wanted to get a good grade, so I wrote. So it, it almost invariably begins with extrinsic motivation. And then once you find something you really like to do, whether it's playing tennis or writing or, uh, you know, hopscotch, it becomes, it becomes intrinsic. But to set that as a goal and say, well, you should be intrinsically motivated is stupid. I mean, it's, it's just, it just it flies in the face of reality. And, and so let's recognize reality, provide extrinsic motivation, and then once the child or the adult finds something they really like to do, they'll keep doing it because they want to, i.e. intrinsic motivation. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so what, the, what, what, the, what that person can do is, is in their parent-teacher meeting is sort of describe what would be most helpful uh, in terms of getting the most out of the child uh, and uh, saying, look, this is something that she needs to remain focused and on track uh, by saying, look, you're, you're doing well, but you got to, you know, and, and 
we want you to continue, and that's great. Uh, so you say you have to shape your environment as as well as yourself. And uh, you know, one of the things that journaling does for a person is is to remind them of the positive, not the negative. The positive. Mm-hmm. Just focus on the positive when you're putting it down, so that you can return back to it, and that can remind you and stimulate you even further. Great. Um, here's a thank you both to both of you so much for reframing the language of vast. I can't possibly describe how much this means to me. So that's from Amanda. Just um, a comment there. Um, how, here's a good question. I think it's kind of the downside of uh, the opposite side of this positive reinforcement. How do you, how, from the person who is able to ask for it, how do you help someone be able to receive positive reinforcement and praise? Both my son and my husband are very quick to listen to and believe negative comments and seem to be impervious to the co- positive ones. So this may be, a, may be part of your shame concept. I'm not sure what your, what your thoughts are on having difficulty accepting positive comments. Well, again, it's sort of an education process of uh, pointing out that you know, we, we, we're generally set up not to search for that, not to ask for that, not to, to, to it, we, and especially the male, wanting to be tough um, and, and, and sort of self-contained. But so they, that has to be pointed out, say it's hard for you to accept this, and that should be something you might try to think about and work on. Uh, and then to try it and see whether they can, you know, feel the, the positive. Okay. Um, let's see. What if the task, this is from Michael, what if the task is truly impossible? Does the praise have to connect with actual reality? <laughs> um, yeah, it, do, it does have to connect with reality, but you, you, can, you can say, uh, you're trying what seems impossible. And, and uh, the best example from my life happened in 12th grade when my, I went to Exeter, which is a very rigorous boarding school up in New Hampshire. And my 12th grade teacher handed me back a story, a three-page story I'd written in September and written at the bottom. I can still see it today in red ink was the simple question, why don't you turn this into a novel? And I thought to myself, holy moly, I knew Exeter was a tough school. I didn't know I had to write a novel. But, <laughs> but he, I, was, I was the only kid he said that to. And, and so I took it as sort of a, a praise, you know, uh, not to mention a challenge. And, and so I undertook to do it. And, and, and he said, you know, this is not an assignment. You'll have to do it on your own time. And if you'd asked me in September what the chances are I could write a novel, I would have said none. Impossible. Fly to the moon more easily. But... I took it on because I really cared about Mr. Tramala was his name and I wanted to please him. And again, we come back to intrinsic versus extrinsic. And so I gave it a go and one page led to another. And by the end of the year, uh, darsh darn it, I'd written a novel that won the senior English prize. But more than that, wow. it, 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 wow. it got me to prove to myself that I could do the impossible or the seeming impossible. And once you've proved that to yourself once, you want to keep doing it. The rest of my life, I've been trying to do the impossible, usually failing. But it's not—it's not a matter of success and failure. You soon came to—you soon come to discover, but staying in the game. And you—you—you you, you learn the truth of that Kipling phrase: if you can look at triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. What matters is staying in the game, and and in my writing that novel introduced me to staying in the game of life and 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 wanting to, you know, loving it. The the game of writing. There are very few games that are more unforgiving than the game of writing. And and uh, but thanks to that man, and thanks to that experience of having done what I would have thought was impossible, my life changed forever. So it, it, particularly early on in life, if you can be a teacher, a coach, a parent, whoever who sets goals that are way higher than, than seem quote-unquote realistic, a term I hate, you might just work that magic that Mr. Tramalo worked for me. That's an extraordinary story, um, Dr. Hallwell, because it was really just one phrase that he wrote that set right. off an entire direction for you. Um, exactly. That's, yeah, so it shows the power of, of, of phrase. Um, 
is there any medical explanation? We have three or four questions around this this issue. That is any do we have any understanding of why the emotional swings of ADHD, both both the positive and the negative, do we understand you know medically what is going on with this? You mean neurologically? You know what? what yeah, happens? neurolog. Yeah, neurologically. Yeah, what? Well, I mean, no, I think I, everybody who listens hears it recognizes immediately that identifies with these traits and is, feels a sense of relief that this is some side, something, you know, outside themselves. But I, they, I think we cast about to want to understand it. I think we're we're beginning to get there in terms of trying to trying to understand what networks are involved and all that. But it still comes down to. Uh, there's this tendency for these swings in in mm-hmm. the ADD person, and that's why it often gets confused with the bipolar patient and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but it seems like it. You know, one day you're high as a kite, and the next day you're down in the dumps, and really down in the dumps, and so uh, or really high as a kite, and then you you uh, you can do that, and you can swing within a day or within an hour. Uh, you mm-hmm. get some encouragement, and you'll be swinging. Uh, you get some bad news, and you'll be down in the dumps, and really down in the dumps. And and it's it, it's a matter of putting those learning to put those brakes on. That's the that's the real challenge uh, for someone with that, uh, so that they maintain at least a, uh, a somewhat equilibrium of outlook and allow themselves to get into the positive and put the brakes on the negative. Okay. Um, this is the last question on this question on this issue. Um, can this emotional sensitivity, both the RSD and the euphoria, be seen in a brain scan? Well, the RSD you can. I mean, one can in the fMRI. You can see what lights up with the and uh, with the uh, the rumination. The people that get really into being really, really? down themselves that they're horrible. Yeah. Uh, this uh, areas of the brain and off off of the default mode network, uh, you can see this sort of charged up uh, kind of thing. Now, people, by the way, pe- it shows you where we're at. People haven't taken up looking at something like euphoria, the the recognition mild euphoria. They haven't looked looked at that yet from from the from the fMRI perspective, but. Uh, we we do see that and well known for for the uh, for the people that that get horribly dysphoric and depressed and they go round and round and round and they can't get out of it. Um, so we we do see that signature in the fMRI kind of scans. Interesting. Okay. Um... Uh, there's a parent here who says, how do we know if we're experiencing this dysphoria and euphoria of, of ADHD or a VAS and not bipolar disease? My son was previously diagnosed with ADHD, but more recently his doctor has wonder, is wondering whether perhaps he has bipolar disorder because he has exactly the dysphoria and euphoria that, that you're talking about. But I mean, that's a matter of degree. Uh, often, okay. and so, you know, it, it's it's like you get stuck in something and then you can't get out of it. Especially, usually, usually the real diagnosis of bipolar comes about when you when you get stuck in the mania, when you get stuck in the euphoria, and you can't get out of it, and you and you lose sleep. And there's a whole bunch of things that really say, okay, well, maybe this really is bipolar. You know, but. And remember, there's a difference, if I can interrupt, there's a big difference between euphoria and mania. Yeah. Uh, ah, mania okay. is, a, is a crazed state where you, you know, you're, you're talking fast, you're grandiose, you're, as John said, losing sleep, you're spending money wildly, your judgment is severely impaired. That's not euphoria. Euphoria is just feeling really good, you know, like we were describing. You know, someone gives you some praise and you think, wow, that's great. I feel charged up. I'm motivated. You don't lose your judgment. You don't become manic. You don't become crazed. Uh, so, so mania is is way – mania is a pathological state, uh, whereas euphoria is a wonderful state. You know, you can't stay in it very long. But it's a it's a very it's a transient but but blissful state that motivates you and can sustain you for a long time. 
Right, and 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 I think the the book, the bipolar child, did a you know identified this uh, too much, and so you have many people who are who who with with vast who get labeled as perhaps bipolar uh, because they get euphoric and they they want to become Superman or they want to become uh, this one gal wanted to be uh, she said she's going to skate so hard so that she can get on the Olympic team. Well, that's, that was seen as being unreasonable, but it was not, you know, she was mm-hmm. just excited about doing it. And, and, but to put a, to put a manic label on it is, is a problem. I mean, and so you really have to have, uh, like Ned said, you have to get way flipped into uh, something that lasts for days. And, uh, and, and then you can begin to, to really say, okay, maybe this is bipolar. Right. Okay. So, this person who's whose do- whose child is having euphoria and and so forth may need more more of a workup to go down the bipolar road. The road that just those yeah. that description possibly for what you're saying. Um, um, an interesting question. Um, you both mentioned that ADHD or VAS comes with both you know highlights and deficits. Um, does ADHD medication dim? Both the pros and the cons of the condition. Like no, 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 no. Not if it's used properly. Uh, if it's used properly, it, it changes you as much as and no more than eyeglasses. Eyeglasses don't make you smarter or stupider, but they do allow you allow you to use your smarts and your creativity more effectively. And that's what medication does when it's used properly. If it should happen to take away your special sauce, your creativity, then you stop it. I mean, it, it's it's very simple. People people overlook the obvious. You know, if if the meds do anything that is that you don't like, you stop the meds. If you turn purple, you stop the meds. I've never seen that, but I suppose it could happen. You know, but anything these meds do is transient, good or bad. And if it's bad, you you stop the meds, or you change the dose, or you change the medication. It, it's a uh, you know, remember, medication is not surgery. It's not permanent. It's transient. Lasts a matter of hours. And so uh, if you took it and you became less creative, don't take it again. But what happens most of the time is you become better able to use, structure, direct your creativity. Yeah, and and, and it can't be emphasized enough that it's it's one medicine that can cause this, it can cause this, the dimming, but the, if you switch to another medicine, it it may not do that. Uh, and so we, we have to search around and not be wedded to oh, it's 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 all medicine is going to do that because it it may not. You have to search for it sometimes. Right. I think that's something we hear often at Attitude, sort of a generic. Instead of realizing there are literally. 30 or 40 options in medication, finding the right one, just assuming that whatever the reaction is, is that's it, definitive. So, um, okay, let's see. This is from Jeff. I've just been diagnosed at 59, and I'm ending a 23-year negative looping cycle. The seminar has asked, answered so many questions of personal doubt. Thank you. So I guess I will end with that. I think that you have done an extraordinary service to our uh listeners, both of you, by pointing out that there is an upside to ADHD, and we're, we're both grateful for all your work for both of you over the years. I think you have brought shed great light upon uh, what I'll call vast for the time being. Um, well, and I want thank to you, to- Susan, for the work you do and Attitude does. It's a tremendous magazine and a tremendous service you you guys provide. Thank you. Thank you. You better we get all this praise, we might get manic. I don't know. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, ne- well, next week I just want to point out that on, uh, after uh, after Thanksgiving on December fourth, we have a get the year back on track. Um, if you're school for parents of kids who you know are just getting the school year, kind of seeing how the school year is going and thinking about what the daily challenges are, and then on Tuesday, December ten, um, and the ADHD anxiety link. So, um, and especially you focus on mindfulness, which I think is of interest to a great deal of our listeners. And with that, I'm going to sign off, wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. And thanks again to Dr. Rady and Dr. Hollowell.